let's take a look at the uh, study questions for Spindon's uh, Enigma of Engineering's Industrial Exemption to Licensure. Number one, according to what Spindon says at the bottom of page 645, 645, what was the motive for the engineering profession to form societies? Uh, if you look at page 645, um, first sentence of the last paragraph, as deaths resulting from failure of the Industrial Revolution's machinery mounted, the profession's leaders resolved that the profession should police itself through formation of engineering societies. So the answer is death. <laughs> the answer is death, injury, mayhem, and destruction uh, of people from uh, the new, from the industrial revolution, from the use of machinery and generally uh, technology, uh, the kind of things that engineers uh, work with. So you can see what he's, you know, what the logic here is, is that uh, because of the dangers, the new dangers having to do with the new industrial technologies, uh, engineers uh, responded, uh, some of them at least, by saying that we have to, we have to form societies uh, that uh, regulate what we do and provide maybe a code of ethics. Uh, it's not, you know, it, 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 it is a tacit recognition of the kind of things that we've been talking about in terms of what makes a profession uh, one of the elements, at least, I think is popping up again and again, is that the kind of things that professionals work with are vital to the safety uh, and welfare of human beings in a way that's uh, maybe more um, uh, extreme than other jobs. So that if you're a doctor, you're working with somebody's body and their life and health. If you're a lawyer, you're working with their property or their freedom. Uh, so these, the importance of what the professional does and the possibilities for harm uh, are what serve as the impetus for something becoming a profession, a self-regulating profession with an ethical code. Uh, if the Industrial Revolution is here now in America and other countries of the world, at the end of the 19th century, then it it. it you know, technology now becomes something which is of vital importance for the welfare of people in their everyday lives. Uh, looking at number two, according to Spindon's account in the early years of engineering as a profession, how did ASCII, A-S-C-E, distinguish itself from AIM, A-I-M-E? Um, we look at page 647, after a description of ASCII, uh, which is civil engineers, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I get this right. Uh, yeah, American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCII, and AIM is uh, American Institute of Mining Engineers. And after a description of what ASCII was trying to do, which is basically push engineering into being a profession by setting very high standards of technical competence and basically trying to raise the level of engineering uh, to a self-governing, self-regulating profession along the lines of doctors and lawyers. Uh, AIM, on the other hand, was basically a front for the mining industry. Uh, as he says here, the nemesis of ASCII's attempts to move engineering into profession status was the AIM, American Institute of Mining Engineering. The Institute's obvious purpose was to serve the mining industry's interests, and it showed no interest at all in developing engineering into a profession. Virtually anyone could obtain full membership. So uh, that's an important thing to note. But, you know, in this struggle or in this process of making, this incomplete process, obviously, of making engineering into a profession, Spindon is saying. Um, there were organizations like AIM, which were basically fronts for business rather than organizations of engineers that were actually trying to grant more autonomy to engineers, to make them into more of a profession thereby, to raise technical and ethical standards, and generally, again, make engineering into an autonomous profession along the lines of law and medicine but then there were other 
organizations, which were just basically uh, the representatives of the business side, not of engineering itself, but of the businesses that employ engineers. And yeah, that it was a front. It was a front for business interests rather than a legitimate uh, organization, society of engineers. So, you know, something that continues to this day, and this is the tension, I think, within engineering as a profession and within engineering ethics, it goes to the very heart of the things. Are engineers supposed to be autonomous, self-governing professionals, or are they simply agents of their employer and so simple employees? So this tension between uh, ASCII and AIM is a continuing tension in in the profession of engineering to this day, there's no question about it. Uh, question three, at the bottom of page 650, Spendin suggests why engineering was not under pressure during the early 20th century to require competency, sorry for the, for the typos here, competency examinations. What does he suggest is the reason? Uh, if I remember, if I'm understanding my own question correctly, you know, forgive me, I wrote these a while ago. If we look at the bottom of page 650, the context is the progressive era in the early 20th century in America when it was basically the era of sort of building good government uh, and building the notion that government was supposed to protect the rights, interests, uh, and welfare of the people. That's sort of what the progressive era was all about. Um, and uh, as they say, a lot, a lot of, there's a lot of regulation going on to do that, government regulation, but it ignored engineering. And then there's a paragraph at the bottom of page 60, 650 that ex explains perhaps why. We're spending rights during this period, however, consumers did not show signs of being concerned by the practices of engineers, probably because they rarely encountered engineers, certainly not as routinely as they did doctors, veterinarians, barbers, hairdressers, electricians, plumbers, and lawyers. Consumers really had cause for consulting an engineer, and engineers then, as now, had little cause for interacting with the public. They did their work for the most part as employees of industrial and manufacturing firms. I think I focused on this in this question because this is like such an important point. Um, one of the reasons, the reason that he's saying that under, engineering was under less pressure to, to regulate itself, to perhaps have licensure, is because engineers largely are, um, are separated uh, from the buffered from the public in a way that these other occupations are not. People rarely come in direct contact with engineers. So there wasn't this public, it wasn't in the public consciousness that engineers should be regulated, that engineers should be licensed to make sure that they're competent, things like that, because they didn't come in contact with engineers like they did with doctors or lawyers or, or other occupations. So this separation this, uh, I don't know what you would call it, this, uh, there's no, this intermediary relationship um, of engineers with the public where there's not this direct, typically, there are sometimes when you meet with engineers as, a, as an average person, as I, I said I have on one occasion at least, but typically we do not come into contact. It's mediated by the employer. So this is incredibly important for the concept of engineering as a profession because Engineers don't have this typical personal, intimate, direct relationship with their clients or the people, at least, that they're affecting through their technology that they're working with. Um, this is a big conceptual problem for considering uh, engineering as a profession because there isn't that direct relationship. Think of how it affects the Seekhart idea, for instance. So it's a, maybe a small matter in terms of the essay in the history of engineering, but it points to a larger issue. Number four, briefly explain the significance of Dent versus West Virginia. This is this case that he describes. Um, can we go to the end of this uh, account of it on page 656? Spindon writes, after Dent, the Supreme Court confirmed in later cases involving physician licensing, the state has virtually unfettered policymaking power in regulating a profession. Pretty much established that government, in this case state government, has the authority to regulate a profession, including um, uh, requiring licensure, licensing, licensure. Uh, four years after Dent, Justice David Brewer 
declared for a unanimous Supreme Court, quote, the power of a state to make reasonable provisions for determining the qualifications of those engaging in the practice of medicine and punishing those who attempt to engage therein in defiance of such statutory provisions is not open to question, basically affirming that the state has a right to regulate uh, medicine, to say that people who don't have the proper education or the people who are practicing it uh, in ways that are quacky or strange or unfounded uh, can be prevented from doing so by the state, by government, for the protection of people. This, of course, has enormous consequences for all the professions, maybe all jobs, but definitely for something like engineering is basically affirming that you know, the, the state has the, the, the legal and moral authority to regulate the profession uh, for the sake of the people, for protecting their health and welfare. So it's really a, actually quite an important case in, in, in relation to anything that would call itself a profession because it's basically saying the state has the right to regulate for instance, to require engineers to uh, be licensed if they see that as a need to, in order to protect people. Number five, what is David Steinman quoted as saying about engineering licensure at the bottom of page 60, 61? Do you agree? Why or why not? If we take a look, what does he say? Steinman acknowledged that engineering licensing laws were, quote, necessary for the safety of the public. But he understood, too, that they were, quote, also necessary for the protection of the good name of the profession. Do you agree? I don't know. Depends on whether you agree that licensing is something that engineers uh, should do. I mean, he's given you two reasons. One is that licensing is necessary uh, for the protection of the public to ensure competence on the part of engineers. And number two, it's necessary for the protection of the good name of the profession. That is, for the status of engineering as a profession it really needs to have licensing requirements um, in order to have a good uh, reputation. I don't know. Do you agree with that? It's up to you. Uh, looking at question six, what arguments does Kohlhoff present in defense of the industrial exemption? Well, um, if you look at page 665, it says Kohlhoff argued the industrial exemption has a specific target to exempt, quote, the internal engineering that is ancillary to the design, manufacture, sale, service, and repair of products of states' industries. Uh, a policy of exempting ancillary engineering is sound, he asserted, because it does not threaten the public's safety and welfare. So. Kohlhoff is saying that, is that the industrial exemption is uh, necessary in order to protect the freedom of engineers from uh, unwanted, unjustified government intervention. That the that Dent, the case Dent was really meant to protect the public from uh, professionals who, uh, uh, yeah from physical harm, forms of economic or physical harms that might stem from services by unscrupulous or unqualified practitioners. Um, but that because most engineers uh, work for large companies uh, that are not engineering firms, but are industrial or other firms that employ engineers, use engineering, uh, that the public is not at, in danger from what, they, what he's calling ancillary engineering. Ancillary would be well, the product of the company is not engineering services. Engineering services are in support of the product that the company makes. That's what ancillary means there. Um, so, uh, as he says, continues there, the only party affected is the one who employs the engineer. Hence, licensing applicable to ancillary engineering is unnecessary and overreaching. Elimination of the exemption would expose engineers in industry to unwarranted licensing thus unduly impinging on the fundamental freedom of engineers working in industry. Basically, the idea that as an engineer working for a larger firm, uh, it is that firm, that company, that takes responsibility for the engineer's work uh, and therefore is takes responsibility for it and so therefore is protecting the public in that way. It's not like somebody out there 
working on their own, like a PE consulting or a, a professional engineer who has their own practice, who's in direct contact with the public, they need to be licensed and they are PEs. But the other engineers who do work, which is ancillary, supporting engineering to the to the main what is the main product of the company, the public is not exposed to them. So if you were to require those engineers to be licensed, that would be an unwarranted intrusion in the freedom of those engineers. I think that is the Kohlhoff argument. Uh, number seven, what criticism does Spindon have of Kohlhoff's argument? I think that Spindon's uh, main criticism is that this whole distinction between primary and ancillary engineering is 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 a, it, it, it's a false distinction engineering is engineering because and and the effect on the public uh is uh is not really different that is if you are an engineer working for ford or general motors or general electric or uh, tesla uh you're working on on uh technologies that people use and it doesn't matter if it's ancillary engineering in the sense that Tesla is not an engineering company, but the, the things that engineers do for Tesla directly affect the public. So this distinction between primary and uh, secondary or ancillary engineering is, is a false distinction. Uh, there is also obviously the idea that the, uh, that the, that the corporation takes responsibility for the uh, work of the engineer and so can, you know, be sued or can be recovered from if they, if they harm the public. Uh, Smindon's argument about that is that's, that's closing the barn door once after the cow leaves. I mean, that is the damage has been done. The idea of licensure is not to set up somebody to sue after somebody has been injured or killed by technology. The idea of licensure is to prevent it happening in the first place. And his argument about the brooding omnipresence and the idea that if engineers were licensed, that their practices would change. And there'd be more of an incentive to keep the safety of the public in mind is, is the, you know, the argument that it's engineers, not their employers, who primarily have to take responsibility for the safety of the public. And of course, that is enshrined in the first canon. Well, the last question, uh, number eight, do you, do you believe that Spindon makes his case that doing away with the existing exemptions to licensure would have an overall positive effect? Of course, that's an open-ended question, but we have to think about what, you know, it's not clear that it would have any effect, really. <coughs> well, that is, if, if engineers had to be licensed, they would be licensed, but they would still be doing their jobs and they would still have employers, most of them. Um, of course, it's a two-sided question. Uh, would it help the public is one side, and would it help engineering as a profession is the other side. Uh, would it help the public? I think that Spindon leans pretty hard on the brooding omnipresence idea. That is, that if you're licensed, that is a, something that hangs there in the background, perhaps in your subconscious, um, that reminds you that you need to take responsibility for your work and you need to take responsibility for the public and that you can't, for instance, lay that off on an employer. The brooding omnipresence, the, the idea of licensing is sitting there. And of course, a license can be taken away. Uh, and, you know, on a rare occasions for PEs, it is taken away. So the whole idea of licensure is a reminder that in, in a certain sense, doing engineering work is a kind of a privilege that you've been granted by the people and the representatives, the state. And that can be taken away and as an incentive to not do anything that would put that in danger. I think on the other side of it, uh, I think Spindon is saying that no one's really going to take engineering seriously as a profession if you don't, you know, make people pass licensing exams to, to ensure minimum competence, which at this point you don't, right? The, the, the shock of reading this is realizing that engineers are required 
they all are required to get licenses in order to operate. But there are these massive exemptions, which are outlined in the, you know, in the beginning of the essay, that, uh, that, that release them from that obligation. The most important one being the industrial exemption, but there are the others too. Um, and so uh, Spindon is saying, well, I mean, if, if there's going to be this massive exemption to licensing requirements, how seriously are we really to take the idea that engineering is, is a profession? I mean, imagine if doctors or lawyers, if there were exemptions to them being licensed, you know, like passing a bar, passing uh, the kind of uh, exams that a, that a uh, test that a, uh, a doctor needs to take, you know. 